these are the five steps uh, that, that you, would, uh, you would have to go through to be able to eventually get to a scale, uh, scalable and economical enough uh, sort of manufacturer. Um, so you, you start from strand development, which is in tiny scale, or less than your coffee mug size, basically. Um, and then uh, once you have a strand that's engineered or have some sort of a metabolic in, you move into strand evaluation where you're trying to say, you know, let's take a look and if the strand is doing the job that you wanted it to do, right? And from there, then you move to process development. This is where the step that you really kind of scale from a micro type of uh, uh, thinking into a bench scale development and then move on to pilot. Well, you're trying to see what things are working in the lab and what things are not working in the lab. And then once you get some sort of a mature process from there, you then move into a pilot scale, uh, scale up, which basically means you're gonna try to find out that, okay, now a lot of the things, maybe 80% each of the things are working in the lab, and then I wanted to see how this looks like in a sort of a commercial reality kind of a scale, right? So that's the first step there. And then you keep going to a gradual, like a larger scale to see how many of these things are still working and how, how many of them are basically, you know, continue to fail, uh, which we have a lot of the examples. And then the final step is basically tech transfer to manufacturer, which then, uh, well now, nowadays the capital market is still, I would say pretty warm to hot. In alternative uh, protein space, you know, uh, that it's a little bit dialing down. But there's a lot of companies there that's actually launching ingredients sort of in a way of the more you sell, then the more you lose kind of a situation to get the, you know, their footprint on the market. But we can talk about that a little bit later on kind of a launching ingredients strategy there uh, to secure the market. Um, but uh, the ultimate goal, as you guys can imagine, is basically to be able to achieve a scalable and economical production, right? So whatever enzymes and protein you're trying to sell, it has to be at a comparable price against the Novozymes or, or DuPont, let's say, or ADM. Um, so with that being said, that now if you think about um, kind of a, so, so th that slide was more about the technical overlook of the process, right? Like if you're a lab person, if you're a CTO, what exactly you have to do to go through this process to launch the, the, the product. And now if you look at in a, in a sort of a market offering uh, a situation here, and um, what, you, what you can do and what you cannot do by just making some phone calls, right? So if I'm a guy just sitting at home and say, hey, I want to make molecular ABCD, can I just sit at home and have everybody else doing it, right? So this is kind of the market landscape, landscape, I guess, kind of perspective. The front end and the later end is actually covered pretty well if you look at the market offerings. Well, that, you know, the strand development, some of you guys are probably familiar with these names. There's Gingago, there's Dimaging, there's VTT in Europe. That's been in business for, I don't know, more or less like 10 years, maybe more than that. Uh, VTT is certainly longer. Um, that you can basically make, it's like a Genentech or Illumina, right? If you want a sequence of DNA down, or uh, what is that company? Uh, 23 and Me, right? You send a sample in, make a phone call, they give you the results basically. So that's how, you know, thinking a way of what market offerings uh, kind of currently stands. And then the tail end, same logic, right? If you say, hey, you know what? I have a, pro a mature process, I have a strand, I just want to do production. Well, who do you call? You call ADM, you call Kaggio. Well, you have to get to pretty significant large scale to get their interest, but you do have that number you can call. So, so now what's happening in this market offering space is something in between is basically getting stuck if you think about it. And the, the, the other perspective to think about this is that majority of the universities with bioengineering programs or uh, quite a few of the startup uh, uh, companies in this space are able to engineer microorganisms for you. And the rate, if you take like a Gingo along as an example, they basically can screen 100 different prototypes of strands per hour, right? So every single hour, you're looking at 100 strands being screened on a micro scale. But then if you think, look at it, so this is the front end, right, if you, of, of screening rate. And if you look at the tail end, how many new molecules or new chemicals that you guys have been hearing per year that's being launched into market as comparable options to chemical to enzymes, right? It's less than five. So you, you would be very lucky for the market if you hear, oh, there's actually new five chemicals or molecules every year in the market. So that rate drop is actually quite scary if you think about it. It's from 100 different strands per hour to five products per year, right? So what basically, well, I don't want to get into a lot of details, but there's a lot of reasons it happening in this middle space, right? Like the rate start you're starting is here, 
the radio end up is basically way probably down on the floor kind of a rate. And what's happening in this middle space, there's a lot of work that we should do, and there's a lot of work here that's uh, basically pain points, and uh, you know, Best probably knows all of them, and RBL is a great example that, uh, that you know, trying to solve these middle space challenges. I mean, I often joke whenever I go back to Boston that half of the town knows the name of RBRL basically uh, because of all, most of the discovery programs is, in, is done in Boston. Whenever they're done with that process and send over the mature, relatively mature process to Illinois to RBRL to you know, scale up that process basically. Um, so because of all these challenges, what we are trying to do, um, or maybe the role I guess that we're trying to play is a uh, scale-up partner for fermentation-based ingredient companies, and we're trying to provide this, uh, this help for them to, to get to that scale. Um, we're really trying to see ourselves as an enabling platform, uh, where we, we're not only playing Sort of a sort of a rental asset kind of a kind of a business model, right? We we, we don't want to well we don't want to only play well. We own a whole bunch of asset and we just rent it out. It's kind of like a real asset business rental model. We not only we want to do that, but more importantly that we want to sort of fill in this knowledge gap, right? So if you think about why all these strands are failing through this sort of graduation pathway, there's a lot of uh, 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 knowledge gap side of the things that we have to we have to do for both fermentation and downstream purification uh, side of the thing. So that's the role that we see ourselves playing. Um, and this is a little bit about business model. The, I guess the key word here among these uh, different categories is really just the flexibility, I would say. Uh, we tailor the business uh, for our clients. And the, the, the way kind of to think about our, our business model is that um, we, do, we do not want to offer, let's say, one single technology Try, trying to fit everything, right? It's like making a shoe, I guess, right? So we, we don't want to offer a standard shoe that fits trying to fit everybody's feet. I don't think that really works. What, what we're trying to do is, let's take a look at whoever the clients come walking to the door, look at measure the feet size and everything, and then tailor that technology for them. So also leading that process into a suitable and feasible CMO eventually for production. And CMO stands for Contract and Manufacturer Organization. So that's what we kind of trying to, 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 to play in this, uh, uh, in this space. Um, couple, I guess a couple quick slides here about, uh, about you know, um, what we kind of, uh, I guess, why are we, why are we really different? I guess I probably won't go into a lot of the details here because you know I know a lot of you guys are not really in this space. But but a couple of things I, I kind of want to really highlight here is that um, uh, we we do offer quite a few let's say categorical side of uh, of the business uh, uh, offerings to the clients. But I think if you have to name one thing that from a technical uh, uh, point of view on what we are trying to fill in is really filling the gap of uh, the disconnection between R&D and the commercial reality. Um, so, so thinking in a way well, if you, if you, if you I guess, kind of maybe imagine yourself being an investor. Well, I mean, Jack and Mark certainly are. So, you know, imagine you're an investor and then you, some of the technology developer comes to you and say, okay, uh, tell me everything about all the KPIs that you are seeing or you are able to achieve in a lab scale, right? They can talk to you for like two hours, maybe long. If you want them to talk, then go five hours. <laughs> but, but then, but, but, but then if you, but by the time comes, you ask them, okay, what's the, what's the commercial reality? What's the technology readiness in this scale and in, let's say, if you want to go to ADM for production for these ingredients or going to DuPont, right, Dennis go for, for production. And then most of them would be like, okay, sorry, I don't really have any idea, right? So I, oh, I have to build some sort of model. I have to get to a certain pilot scale to see what the KPIs look like. So what we are trying to do here is really to bridge that gap and trying to play that role that either for investors to come to us and or for clients or maybe even partners in the future, we're developing this model in the middle well, that it's based on three different platforms on bacteria, yeast, and fungal to quickly help you screen through and have a multiple stage landscape of cost of goods, sort of a, sort of a blueprint for, for, for most of the clients to see how this gap can be bridged and what we really need to do to be able to get to a commercial uh, uh, you know, reality. Um, the, the other kind of technical side of the things that I wanted to kind of highlight is that uh, when most of us think about uh, what the fermentation market is, that I think 
the majority of us kind of got too used to fermentation uh, uh, world, I guess, right? If you like, if you kind of uh, think about what business most of these folks are in, I think everybody is kind of comfortable or somewhat familiar with this fermentation world. But then, if you think about the, this in the past five years on what fermentation ingredients have really been, is that um, in a comparison way, I guess, from 15 years ago to roughly 10 or 5 years ago-ish, if you look at the products that DuPont ADM is producing, when fermentation is done, the job is done, right? So if you think about, let's say, single amino acids or even biofuel, from, or think about ethanol fermentation, really, right? So when the fermentation is done, what you would do is probably just kind of do some sort of a simple filtration. Well, if you're doing whiskey and stuff, you might have to do some distillation and concentrating, right? But that's a different, little bit different story. But I guess the point here I'm trying to kind of take you to is that uh, for a lot of the ingredients that's occupying significant industrial assets, like, um, you know, 500,000 liter type of scale assets, which ADM and Kagyu owns, is that those production processes that when fermentation job is done, the whole production job is more or less done. But then if you think about in the past five years with the significant boost of, uh, of, uh, of symbio, synthetic biology, right? The, the protein, the enzymes that you're engineering and you're trying to sort of force it into the microorganism is that when they, when they are done growing, when they are done expressing that protein, that protein is only a very minor portion of this whole system that you're culturing. So the, the more than 50% of the job left when fermentation is done is basically downstream. Right, so think about how you're gonna get that protein out of the whole system. You, you're done with fermentation, right? So think, think in your ethanol case again. Like, say, I mean, I'll, you know, I'm sure you guys enjoy some different uh, sort of a summer type of beers, right? But every single, a lot of the beers probably has different flavors. Think in a way of, in the past five years, what you're trying to produce is not that ethanol that you drink. It's about that, that, that specific molecular that gives you the flavor that you want to extract out of that, that beer or out of that ethanol system. How do I do that? Certainly when fermentation is done, your job is not done, right? Because that molecular is only like 10%, maybe less of your process. So this is what we offer here or as, a, as kind of a key highlight, which is downstream processing to get that molecular out. Um, so uh, I guess that's kind of the technical scope of things that what we do. And here's our assets. Um, and uh, we, have, we are building our uh, lab and the pilot, um, and it's in the food science and human nutrition uh, building right across uh, uh, RBRL. Um, and we have an office in, uh, in Research Park, and uh, we're already kind of coming to a, to, a, to a place where we need a little bit of expansion space. Um, these ones on the top line are the assets that we have for you know most of the process development and um, and you know a little bit of medium scale I guess in the future the the assets in the bracket is basically um, you know RBR asset well basically best assets um, so <laughs> I put it here local partnership because the slides is used for you know general purposes I guess but all of you guys here know this is RBRL um, and we have a whole bunch of you know downstream solid separation purification TFF. Uh, homogenizer, which is sort of a border technology from food science into cell lysis uh, area, we basically have everything on the on the more or less on the bench scale, and then YRBL has you know every single thing listed here on the pilot scale. Um, another thing maybe worth mentioning here is that we do have a great relationship with Mario, which is in Chicago. They are a FDA certified uh, lab. And uh, they basically run our sort of in-process analysis and final products analysis when we prepare a GRASS dossier uh, to FDA. Uh, and GRASS stands for generally recognized as safe. So that's basically a process you have to help clients work through to basically launch the products into the market, right? To make FDA happy, basically. Um, so in a way, I would say FDA is kind of uh, working through this journey together with us. We have phone calls, you know, on a sort of sometimes monthly based, sometimes quarterly based to figure out, you know, how, what exactly downstream process means for certain ingredients and what purity is actually a reasonable purity, right? Because FDA got a lot of cases in the, you know, say, for example, you know, you guys probably know Impossible Foods, which is a typical example. Um, I don't know how many of you guys tried their burgers. And I also don't know, if you, I don't know if you guys read really into these things. The heme bovine myoglobin they're adding to the soy protein actually only has 65% purity. And nobody knows what the other 45, 35% is in actually in that red blood, let's say analog scene now. But FDA considers it as safe, right? We consider it as safe as well, because you know, we develop the processes. 
So just as an example for you guys that some of the purity, some of the concentration might sound scary, but it has to work through a pretty tight process to justify the safe use of it. Um, here's a, a client uh, a testimony, I guess, um, and this is public and we're working with this company based in Chicago. Um, and as you can see that Aviero's name is clearly mentioned in this PR. And uh, we basically helped them, you know, to pull the uh, three months ahead of the schedule. Uh, uh, and, you know, in a startup case, you know, this is a pretty significant uh, uh, time saving. It could be related to critical investment wrapping up or even launching products into market, right? Um, so that's the, a good example to, to show, I guess. Um, a little bit about the team. Uh, I try. I try to add our the, uh, whole team kind of profiles, but I haven't got the <laughs> the actual. Yes, Pess actually was asking me the other day. So I only still got the two of us uh, here, but I figured it still was mentioning something. Um, that you know, as Laura mentioned, that I spent a lot of years at ADM, and and before that, I quite a few years on biofuels space. And um, uh, then at Motif, um, developed the ingredient and uh, launched the Boba My uh, in two years. And um, uh, Ted, my partner, uh, he covers the finance side of the things. He has a MIT MBA, and he was the new venture director for for Level VC, which is, you know, I would say one of the highly reputable uh, VC in the uh, you know in the alternative protein space. Um, we have uh, we have eight people now, and. Um, I guess maybe this is kind of something worth bragging a little bit about because uh, we had a great pipeline from University of Illinois. Um, among the eight people, we one of the senior, relative senior engineers is coming from uh, PepsiCo uh, after four years uh, in New York City, and, um, and the other is we relocated him from uh, uh, Northwest. Uh, Northeastern University, right? The one in Boston. And then uh, our head of bioprocess, he's got 15 years of biopharma experience, uh, uh, you know, working on a lot of the small molecules, so it's a fantastic uh, uh, person. And then the rest of the team is basically kind of all related to, uh, to uh, uh, University of Illinois. We have two interns from them from a professional science master degree, I believe. Uh, and then we have a, uh, a 20 hour part time in, uh, incoming um, um, in, you know, starting from August. And we, uh, uh, there's also another one that's incoming. Um, uh, she's finishing her PhD at uh, um, uh, uh, environmental my, uh, microbiology department. Did I say? I'm sorry, I probably don't remember the department name. It's a, it's a, her major is a, a environmental microbiology, basically. She's finishing her PhD, defending in September, and then joining us. Um, so really appreciate all the, I would say, the sponsorship and resources, and the, particularly the talents pipelines that the uh, university is providing to us. Uh, it's been really kind of a great home um, after we relocated um, from you know, multiple angles, I would say, from partnership, from talents, from resources. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, thank you again for this opportunity for, for presenting this. And uh, yeah, let me know if there's any questions uh, uh, now or uh, uh, I guess afterwards and there's the email. And also, you know, I guess I can share my LinkedIn and email afterwards if you guys are interested. Um, thanks. Thank you.